Brothers, sisters, and friends, welcome to CRC. And yeah, well, we're going to worship the Lord. Thank you for coming here. Dennis, are you excited to worship the Lord? Yes. Amen and amen. Arnel, what about you? As always. I like that answer as always. Oh, good to see you, brother. Say, Junel, that's good to see you, brother Junel. Awesome. Okay, so yeah, uh, let us all stand up. Uh, <laughs> let us worship the Lord. And before we worship the Lord, uh, there's a scripture that says in John 8.32 that um, um, he is the way, the truth, and, uh, and the life. And uh, hey, whoever uh, believes in the Lord, they are, they are, uh, they are free. Uh, we are free indeed. And then, uh, yeah, if we are free, then we are free to worship the Lord, free from guilt, free from shame, free from uh, anxiety, free from uh, negative thoughts. All we have to do is just come in the presence of the Lord and worship him for who he is. He is good and he, he is, uh, his love is uh, eternal. Amen? Amen. Let's give thanks. It's always to give thanks to the Lord. Even if you're in the midst of the problem, just give thanks. In all circumstances, give thanks to the Lord.
is fighting for us. Shout it. 
New mic. How's that? Oh, there I am. That's all right. It's my high soprano voice coming through. So, welcome to church. It's great that you're here this morning and uh, wonderful that we can be together, have the freedom to come and worship and sit around the Word of God, the table of the Lord. It's just a good opportunity, isn't it? If you're visiting with us today, welcome. Thank you for coming and being part of our fellowship today. And we pray really that God will speak to you because you're here today. Why don't we turn and say hello to someone, greet someone, maybe someone you don't know, if you, if you can do that. Hello. Okay, if you like to take your seats, thank you. That would be that would be good. Last Sunday, we had the uh, fundraiser for the Gisborne Wairoa region, and I've been handed the the tally so far: sixteen hundred and twenty-four dollars and thirty cents. Well done, well done. Thank you, Arnell and team. Uh, great job. Good food, and. Uh, yeah, it was, was wonderful, so we really, really appreciate it. I've been in touch with uh, Pastor Bruce up in Gisborne, and they're doing okay. They're doing well. They're recovering quite well. Um, still huge n- m- amount of needs, etc. but, you know, they're, they're working their way through it. The, the, the good part about the, um, the church there is that they're very connected because of the Tahahi Trust that uh, Michelle is employed by, very connected to the, um, the services there, the emergency services, and they pro- have been providing care and food, etc., for the region for n- a number of years now. And uh, so they're working, they're very busy, as you can imagine. Next Saturday, I saw Josh here. Haley's, she's out probably cleaning up out there. They're getting married next Saturday. And. <laughs> And then on Sunday, we're having a, um, a lunch put on 
by the Burt family, by Margaret and Randall, and, and of course Josh and Hayley, uh, to celebrate for all of us, because the wedding on Saturday is up in Martinborough. Um, so there's a lunch on here on Sunday of next Sunday, so come. And if you want to contribute to that, just have a chat with Margaret. And uh, um, But there's, I think it's, it's going to be fully catered for anyway, so you're all welcome to come. And, as I announced quietly last week, Josh is going to turn 40, so... Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's celebration or commiseration, I'm not sure which, but uh, um, mind you, when you're at my end at 65, 40 is like stop complaining and enjoy it, but anyway. This coming Tuesday, ladies uh, meeting uh, here at the church, if more information, have a chat with Pastor Christine, um, and uh, yeah, just uh, ladies, you know, check, have a look around, um, invite others, other women to this group, it's a great group. Um, Good ministry, good teaching, etc. Tuesday nights, what time, Christine? 7, 7 p.m. right here. Easter is not that far away. Can you believe it? So I can't, but anyway. Easter services, we'll have a Good Friday service at 9.30 on Good Friday. On the Wednesday night prior, from 7.30, we're going to have a, um, a healing service here. Um, and uh, 7.30 um, to about say nine-ish, um, there's going to be prayer, there's going to be worship and prayer for, for healing, etc. So any, anyone you know that needs prayer, um, bring them along. Um, and uh, someone's, I was talking to someone recently about it and they said, but Pastor Mark, like you've got cancer, what are you going to do? No, my faith is, is built on the Word of God, not just on my experience and I expect to be prayed for that night too. So uh, we, we will do that. But um, I'm tapping into a very ancient tradition that goes way back to the uh, about the end of the second century where the church, uh, the church as, as part of their Easter program would have a healing service on, on the, a Wednesday prior to the Easter um, the services. And in fact, you can read many a phenomenal um, miracle that occurred over that period of time because it is about the resurrection and, uh, and about life. So we're going to do that. So I'll put something out, it'll be on our website, I'll put out some emails, we'll, we'll put out so, uh, uh, some sort of in invitation so that you can forward on, we'll do it digitally, you can forward on to people uh, for that. So that's coming up, 7th through the 9th is Easter, 7th is Good Friday, 9th is Easter Sunday, and um, should be great, should be great. Okay, f there's some food out in the back hall again, please take it, use it, give it away, it's up to you, that's what it's for. Bless someone or be blessed with it, yourselves. Um, wonderful. Okay. We have uh, Shine doing communion today, and I'm sharing the word today. It's good to, good to be here, good to be able to be back sharing the word and looking forward to it. We're going to take up an offering, so let's do that. Let's pray over that, and uh, then we'll invite to Shine to come and, and lead us around the communion table. Amen? Um, Father, and thank you. Lord, particularly as we, we uh, focus, as we head towards Easter and the resurrection, Lord, that fantastic, that amazing, that life-changing event that Father, that, that is that we celebrate annually. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your goodness. It was always your purpose and your will that Jesus would rise from the dead. And so, Lord, because of that, there's so much open to humanity, to people everywhere. We thank you, Lord, and, and our, our love response, Lord, our response to you, Lord, is not only we give ourselves to you and we thank you. As we take up this offering, Lord, there are many needs in our congregation and many needs around us. And Father, we pray for your provision. We thank you for, for jobs. We thank you for incomes, for finance. We thank you for all the stuff that life requires of us. But Lord, above all else, we give you thanks for it. We ask, Father, for open doors for people, for change for people, for improvement for people, for miracles in finance for people, of provision, Lord, from you. And so, Lord, we ask all these things. You call us to be bold, to come to the throne of grace boldly, so that in times of need, Lord, we would find that grace. And so we do that today. On behalf of those that, that need it, Lord, on behalf of uh, people that are struggling, Lord, not just in the church, but around about us, we pray for a blessing, that we would be blessed to be a blessing to others, according to your word in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless. Thank you.
I know we Manuel brothers have been taking up all the time, all the screen time this month. I know it's understandable, you know. Statistically, it is improbable, but then there is always those fringe areas in the bell curve, so miracles are possible, you know. <laughs> so that's what happens in a Christian life. Anyways, I'd request the volunteers to please distribute the emblems. Right. So on, the, uh, on our way in the uh, Christian life, you know, there are a few faces that we um, encounter. So I just try to take the context from two of the events in the Bible. One was the burning bush and the other was the road to Damascus. So we know what happened at the path of burning bush where Moses was encountered by God. And in the road to Damascus, Paul was encountered by God again. And in both the cases, both of these people, both Moses and Paul, both of them thought that before their encounter with God, they thought that they were doing God's work. Moses thought that if I'm killing this Egyptian, I'll be saving one of my brother, which he did. And he thought that he did right in the eyes of God, and God thought his way was correct. Paul thought the similar way. He also thought that, you know, when he is killing all these Christians off, when he's deleting them, he thinks that he was doing God's work. That's what the law said. And that's why I am doing what is right. But it took a shaking on their life for them to realize what God actually thought his work was. When Moses encountered the burning bush, he was said, you are standing on a holy ground. You did not do what was holy. You might have repented. You might have run away from Egypt. You might have run away from all their idolatries. You might have run away from all their lifestyle. But you still are not holy. Remove your sandal. It doesn't mean that, you know, I have to stand here without my sandals. That's not what it means. What it means is that you have to change your way. He had to change his path. He had to change his thought process. He had to change how he lived. And at the burning cross, at the, at the burning bush, he had to change the way of his entire life. He's 80 years old. You're asking an old man, you know, people who lived at the age of dinosaur, that's what pastor always say. Those people are very hard to change, especially a man. He's already ingrained in the path that he has to live. And now to change the path, his way is going to be really difficult for him. But that's what the burning bush meant. Paul lived a life of pious life, a very pious life. He was one of the best of the Pharisees. And he followed the law to the letter. Yet when he was on the way to the Damascus, when he was on that path, 
he was encountered by Christ there. And at that point of time, he realized something that what he thought was godly is not godly in the eyes of God. There is a difference between what we think is right and what God thinks is right. And that's what changes everything. It's only when we are able to open our eyes to see what is godly that we realize that we have not been living that way. And at the communion table, Jesus was telling his disciples the same thing. Just before communion, he told Judas, look, someone is going to betray me. Someone is going to betray me. And Judas was upright and said, oh, is it me? Of course you said it. Of course you all know what is going to happen. The change of heart was to be allowed to him. He was allowed that opportunity, and yet he could not grasp it. And herein, Jesus was saying after that, look, your life was different as a disciple. When you were following all those words, when you thought that you were doing all the godly, godly things, your life was different. But now, at this table, I'm going to change your life. If you are accepting this table, if you are accepting this communion, your life is going to be changed. And that's not, what, that's not going to be what you're thinking is godly. That's not what you're thinking is going to be your life. When we come into a relationship with someone in a marriage relationship, when we come to that relationship with the thought process of that my life is going to be happy, you are bound to fail. And Jesus was telling them there. Do not think that your life is going to be full of roses. Oh, I should say jasmines because roses have thorns. But anyway, you should not think it that way. And at the communion table, Jesus was telling them, what you think is going to happen is not what is going to happen in your life. If you are accepting me as your partner, if you are accepting God as your partner, your life will be completely different. Paul said in his life, everybody thinks that Paul became a Christian because he wanted power, because he wanted wealth, because he wanted to be famous. They are projecting what is happening today to that part of life. But Paul himself said, I was shipwrecked. I was flogged. I was thrown out of the city thinking that I was dead. That is the life of Christ. And Jesus showed it through his own life. He was the Complete example for that kind of life. At burning bush, Moses was baptized by that fire. His heart, his life was changed by God. At the path of Damascus, Paul's life was changed by God. Such that he was able to give a complete explanation on the Lord's table. He was completely changed. And the communion is meant for that. It's meant to change us. Every single week when we come here, we are standing before that burning bush, remove our sandals, consider the ground holy, and try not to talk over God. Let him talk in your life. Let him place that blind on your eyes to remove the worldly things and then open it to see what is God's life. That's what we are seeing in the table of communion. Nothing else can matter. If we are not ready to do that, then we are not going to conquer Egypt. Then we are not going to become a Christian. Until that point of life, we are nothing but a mere, mere human. We are not Christians. To be proudly called as Christian, we have to accept that cross of God. So let's all rise up and let's read the verse that Jesus said in Matthew 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing, let us all bless this bread. Just as Jesus blessed, blessed the bread, we will bless this bread for this is his body. That's what he said. It's not a literal piece of meat. It is a representation of his body. And just as the fire did not burn the bush, 
let this bread not burn us. Because this is holy. And therefore, if our path does not follow the holy life, this will burn us. Yet at the same time, if we are being a Christian in heart and in soul, and if we are following what God wants us to do, this will be the light of our life. So let us all bless this bread and partake in it. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, see, it's not just blessings that we have to do, it's also thanksgiving. For thanksgiving is the best of the sacrifices. Let's give thanks to God, to God for the blood that he shed for us. Let's all praise him, because that is what made us presentable in the eyes of God. Without this blood, Without this blood, we cannot stand in his presence. This is what covers us. This is what covers our sins, our unrighteousness, our all the errors and mistakes in our life and makes us eligible to stand in front of him and say, you are my father. And without this blood, we are nothing. And therefore, let's give thanks to God for this blood. Let's all drink the blood of Christ. And then he said, for this is the blood of covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. And I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of wine until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. That is his promise. His promise is not happiness. His promise is not pleasure. His promise is not wealth. His promise is that he will be there with you throughout your life until and also in, the, in, the, in his father's kingdom. And that's what we are looking for. And that's what is a Christian life. Thank you, Father Lord. You're so good. It's always good to remember what Christ has done on the cross. From there, we can stand in his presence. Thank you, Lord, for you are holy by your righteousness, Lord God. We are partakers, Lord, of your holiness. Help us to live in a holy life, Lord. Worthy, Lord God. Worthy to stand in your presence. As Christ, Lord God, we are sure, Lord God, that we are righteous in your sight. Not because of what we've done, Lord, but because of what your son has done on the cross, Lord. We can sing, Lord. We can worship. We can say, thank you, Father, for you are holy, God. No one is above you, Lord. No one is like you. We can say, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord God.
worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are.
working my father in heaven the father in heaven keeps on working as Jesus keeps on working yes Lord sometimes we can't see it Lord but at the background Lord you can we can be assured Lord God that you keep on working father God for all of us Lord sometimes it's hard to see father God sometimes as if we see there's no way but you can make a way father you keep on working, Father God in heaven. You're so good, Lord. And we will be amazed, Lord God, seeing the way you're about to, to do, Lord. All we have to say, Lord God, is just thank you, Father in heaven. You are so good. Your love is eternal, Lord. We can rely on your promises, Lord. We can rely on your loving kindness, your faithfulness, Lord. Your mercy endures forever. We can trust in you, Lord. You keep on working, Lord. You are the miracle worker, Lord. You are the way maker. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Shukuramata Samaka Kasuma. Holy is your name. Holy is your name. Holy is your name. Haraka Kasuma. Oh, holy and life-giving spirit, thank you that you dwell with us. And as you dwell with us, I pray today, Lord God, that you will touch each heart, speak to each person. It will change futures. It will it'll change the impact that the past is having on people's lives. Oh, Thank you, Jesus, that you sent your spirit. Lead us into all truth. Guide us. And so, Father, as we open up our word today, let the words that I speak, that I've spoken today, bring honor to your name. We'll lift up your name as Father. We'll glorify the precious Son, Jesus. And we'll release your Holy Spirit into our lives like maybe never before. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have a, thank you. Have a seat. Thank you. Thank you, team. It's good to be here. It's good to uh, be able to open the Scriptures today. I'm glad you're here. Otherwise, it would just be me speaking to an empty room. So it would be nice to have you here. A few weeks ago now, I, I began continuing a series on um, encounter. And I touched on um, the first part of a two-part message that I put together on um, the Holy Spirit. I want to just make some things clear about the Spirit before I actually get into my message. As part of my preparation for this I've done a lot of reading in various places ancient modern different theologians etc different church denominations and so on and one thing I have actually picked up that we need to to overcome is that many people treat the Holy Spirit as like electricity a power and that's it and not a person and not a being not a, um, like Jesus is the, the Logos, the Son, the Father. Um, and, and the fact that, that a lot of writing today about the Holy Spirit only talks about Him like, um, let me describe it this way. When I was first, we first bought our first house, we had this solid brick house in Adelaide and it was a great place and we had this great carport and I had a double garage, it was really cool and, and the light in the garage, just you'd turn it on, it would go... And it was like, it really annoyed me. And I wasn't an electrician. And so I thought, I know, I'll fix it. So I grabbed the, and I leant over and I got out of the car. It was late at night. It was a bit dark and the light was going. So I switched it off. And as I walked towards the, the grabbed the switch, which had come away from the wall, I tripped. And I grabbed the switch and found myself launched across the, the carport, bouncing off the car, and my body and my arms going. <laughs> and I had to let go of this thing. And many people think that that's what the Holy Spirit is like. That's not. The Holy Spirit is a person, is, is personal, is a being. And Jesus spoke to him as him, not it. And as Pentecostals, we often go down the track of actually looking for the, the electric shock that I had, <laughs> rather than a real understanding of the entity called electricity. I had a whole new respect for electricity from that moment. Okay, I really did. And I walked in and Julie said, you all right? I, yeah, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me, you know. But a lot of people run after the, the evidence of or the, the just the the it part, the consequence, rather than the person. 
And when I go back over, and as I've read about, you know, previous revivals and moves of the Spirit and so on, it always starts with the incredible, the presence of God through the presence of the Holy Spirit who comes and, and becomes very present with us. And often what happens is that it generates into a, let's chase the signs and wonders. Now, I'm not against signs and wonders, trust me. I've seen some great stuff in my life and some weird stuff in my life and all sorts of stuff. But I want to put that on the shelf today. Because that's, if you like, the grabbing of the electricity rather than understanding the, you know, and honouring and respecting the electricity. And when you do that, when you honour and understand electricity, you can do some amazing things. And, you know, you can run devices, etc., without killing yourself. It's really helpful that way. And so, as I've gone over the, the particularly some of the early revivals, the Welsh revival and so on, began out of prayer, met, most of them start out of prayer, and the Spirit of God comes, and there's this great sense of God's presence. And what is the re reaction, and we heard of it last week and we heard today, the reaction of the people is that there's a sense of the call to holiness. Because the Spirit of God is not the diluted version of the Father or the Son, it is of the same essence, and I'm quoting the early church fathers. He's one and the same, made of the same stuff, if I can use that, which is a little bit shallow, but nonetheless. And so... If Jesus walked into this room, I'm sure many of us would fall to our knees. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we think he's like a remote control. And that's not the picture that the, the Bible um, presents. And so I was, I was surprised, actually, some of the writers that I read about the, 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 him being, the Spirit of God being it. And this, this impersonal thing, power, but it's not who he is, bit of scripture, last time I spoke about Acts 19, and Acts 19, excuse me, I'll just change that, Acts 19 was the coming of the Spirit and, and uh, uh, to the, these disciples, etc., but I want to go back to some, some fundamental scriptures here, the words of Jesus in Luke 24 are really important, we, we listen and hear these. He uh, instructs his disciples to stay in Jerusalem to receive the promise of the Father. Let's have a look. Luke 24, 44 through 49. I'm reading from the New King James. Then he said to them, verse 44, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. This is after the resurrection, of course. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Verse 48, you are my witnesses of these things. Behold, he said, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. The passage is a clear indication as to what the promise of the Father is. And if, you've, if you have some understanding of the Old Testament prophets like Joel, you actually see that Joel makes quite a, a statement that's repeated in Acts chapter 2. The Acts chapter 2, we, many of us will know this, after the coming of the Spirit, you're in the upper room, 120 people, and uh, Holy Spirit comes, there's tongues and noise and there's all sorts of things going on and they've accused them of being drunk. Peter gets up and says this, But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants, on my maid servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heavens above and the signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon went into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is almost like a miniature map of what it is from, from the Acts chapter 2 to the return of Christ. In, in what is that? Uh, about five verses. 
but I love the promises that are there. A lot of people think, and in, in, in some, particularly the early Pentecostal world, it was all about tongues. Well, that's not true. It's not all about tongues. And, and, in, and Jesus makes it clear in Luke, in Luke 24 that there's something greater going on here than just tongues. Tongues are important. Tongues are great. Tongues are wonderful. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. We should be speaking in tongues. We should be praying in tongues in our private, you know, in our private prayer life. When we don't know what to pray, pray in tongues. Man, I've prayed in tongues a lot in the last two, three, four, five years and but a lot of other times. Because you run out of words, you run out of, how do I pray for things? And we'll explore the gifts of the Spirit and the operation of, of those gifts. But the baptism of the Spirit, the coming of the Spirit, the promise, the endowment of power is not just about the getting the shock on the PowerPoint. It's far deeper and richer than that. It's actually the empowering to provide that that connection with the Spirit of God that empowers us to come alive in a way that we've not come alive before. I love the way it ended in in, in, Acts 2. And whosoever, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love that. This, this passage is, is so critical, is so important because it actually describes what we should expect in our lives and in the church across the world. In my connections with the persecuted church, with the underground church, with the Middle Eastern church, this is what's happening. Prophecy, visions, tongues, interpretation, miracles, it's happening now. And anyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I love that. It's so good because it opens it up. It's not about male and female. It's not about domination. It's not our identity is in Christ. It's the fulfilling of that, the endowment of power that comes through the Holy Spirit that changes our destiny and changes who we are and moves us into a place of richness with God and relationship with God. And I think sometimes, you know, you, I don't know if you've hung out with missionaries, you actually think they have a single message, and this is the message, and it's the right message. And it's in Luke 24, Jesus said this, and that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached to all in, in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance, remission of sin, the forgiveness of our personal sin, the forgiveness of that sin, and repentance, the turning away from that sin and turning to God. That's the missionary message. That's the message we should be hearing. That's the message we should be living. Our life should be one of a repentant life. And enjoying that sense of forgiveness that only comes from God. Why? Because he decided that's what he was going to do. Because it was his intention. It's not about coercing God to to forgive me. It's about accepting what he has always intended and offers through Christ for each of us. So the Pentecostal experience is about an endowment of power to bring that message, to live that life. And yeah, the gifts of the Spirit, we get access to the gifts of the Spirit. Incredible. Miracles and prophecy and all the others. And I think that I read some interesting... Um, notes in some study Bibles. Just remember that the, the Scripture's inspired, not the notes. Um, the notes aren't inspired, they're just commentary, okay? So just be, be wary. Even some of your favourite Bible teachers sometimes can go, yeah, well, man, I don't think they're really wanting to read the Scripture. And there's one, I won't mention his name, an American who is anti-Pentecostal, and I thought, and I've got a copy of his study Bible, and I thought, I'll, I'll be interested to see what he says about 1 Corinthians 12, 14. And so I thought, so I'm reading, and I go there, and there's this very little about it. And I thought, you coward, you chicken, come on. You, you know, if you, if you get, prove, prove, tell me what you believe. And he didn't. And I actually think that because we have... We, we've westernized the Pentecostal thing, we've made the Pentecostal thing about acceptance and, and there was a, it, funny, I was in Pastor Paul King's kitchen one day, Warrell pastor, and on his fridge there was an article by a local pastor who said, 
This is the, in their local paper, right? This was cut out of their local paper. Come to our church. Nothing unusual ever happens in our church. That was his ad. <laughs> and I'm thinking, mate, really? <laughs> uh, so, like, really? I mean, when the Holy Spirit moves, I don't know about you, but when the Spirit of God wants to do something in people's lives, unusual things happen. Now, I'm not, I'm not endorsing the extreme weird end of all of that. What I'm saying is that when he comes and, and, and he, he comes into a, a, a space or a group of people or a person, an individual, it is transformative. It's meant to be transformative. Not just come to our church, nothing weird happens. Great. Um, my first thought, and I said to Pastor Paul, I said, do you know the guy? He said, yeah. He said, congregation about 10 people. It's the most boring place you've ever been. It's like, well, he's advertising that. So what would you expect? People think this is all about speaking in tongues. It's not. That's an evidence. Baptism in the Spirit, the, the, that second experience, and I stand as a Pentecostal. I've studied this. I've, worked, you know, I've looked at this. And, and Acts 19 and other places where the, 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 the evidence is clear that even the disciples in Acts chapter 2, they'd be walked with Jesus. They'd gone through the, the resurrection. He'd blown on them. He said, receive the Spirit. And yet he says, what you do is when you go to, to Jerusalem, you're going to be endued with power. It was like, hang on a second. I thought that they were born again. Yeah, I think they were. Even the Acts 19. They were called disciples. Born again. I use the term born again. And we need to hear it again. You know, born from above. John 3. Are you born again or are you just attending church? There's a big difference. I didn't know what that difference was. I thought, you know, the way to heaven was you go to church. You know, and you'd be nice to, the, particularly the pastor. I mean, always be nice to the pastor. But, you know, you'd, you'd, we had Sunday best dress. You know, we had Sunday best. Remember that? Who, who remembers Sunday best? Yeah. I mean, you know, if you, I remember when I came to Christ, I went to a church and they wore jeans. It was the 70s, and they had, don't tell anyone, but I went to a church where they had long hair. But these people that I met were radically transformed from addicts and surf lifestyles and terrible uh, lifestyles. The Holy Spirit has come upon them, and they're out witnessing, and they're bringing people to Christ, and they're still surfing, but they're leading people to Christ out on the waves. How cool is that? What a mission field. I think I've got a, an old surfer here somehow. <laughs> the Luke passage is really important. He says that these things must be fulfilled. They will be fulfilled. And they are fulfilled. And I think it's really important that we actually just pause and think about what he's saying. That endowment with power. I remember as a, a young Christian, very young Christian, you know, I didn't mean a Christian, you know, a few months, and, uh, or actually probably a year, and I was reading my Bible, I was praying, I was doing all sorts of stuff, and I thought, yeah, this is what it's about. But I kept running over passages about, and I, you know, when the Spirit of God comes, He'll lead you into all truth. I read Acts chapter 2, wait, I read Luke 24, and it's like, hang on. There's something else going on here. And so I explored it. I remember I shocked one pastor and I said, can you tell me about the baptism in this Holy Spirit thing? He said, wow, no one's ever asked that question. Sit down. And so he went through the scriptures and explained to me what it was based on that promise in Joel 2. That God didn't want his people just to be can I say this? Understand what I'm saying. Nice people that just be nice and that's it. We're called to respect, we're called to care for others, we, you know, etc. And, and in the context of what I'm saying, understand what I'm saying. But there's something more that God wanted from his people in relationship with him. And it was part of his gift to us to empower us to live a life that is very different. Very different. Because I don't know about you, and I, I, you know, I think most people 
in our cultures that we live in and you know we like things worked out and nice boxed and easy to understand and it's comfortable and it's you know yeah I've worked out my theology on this and my theology on that and on the Holy Spirit and you know, have systematic theology you know what I've discovered the longer I hang around the systematic theology I realize there is no systematic theology because what the Holy Spirit does he comes across and, and we have doctrines and different things of course and I'm not belittling those but the life in the Spirit is one of being led by the Spirit it's being empowered by the Spirit, by this person of the Holy Spirit who, we, who comes and He comes into us and lifts us into a different place. And one of the consequences of tongues, prophecy, can be miracles, healings, etc. In Luke 24, Jesus says, I'm sending you the promise question do you trust Jesus that's a good question I do you have to work that out is he telling the truth well I would think so his reputation is pretty truthful so we're pretty right but many people act and carry on as though oh that's not for me really but he says hang on I'm sending I'm giving this it's my gift to you got to start though in the place of actually as I started earlier of who the Holy Spirit is the work of the Spirit of God let's just get some clarity because we're going to get you go in to a little bit a little bit of depth today he's the active he's active in the redemption plan of God John in the plan the redemption plan of God there's no question about that John 16 8 John 3 5 and 6 etc he brings us to salvation he convicts us John 16 he produces conversion and regeneration Regeneration is spiritual rebirth, born from above, born again. When I came to Christ, it was, you know, most people, it was either the Living Bible or the King James Bible. It was like, are you born again? Probably literally, it should be, are you born from above? Okay, are you born from above? Have you had spiritual rebirth? It's a good question. Read John chapter 3, you'll see that. Titus 3, Ephesians 2, etc. He liberates us from the power of sin and death so we can be holy, Romans 8, 2. He gives us an inward assurance of salvation. Romans 8 says this, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him. Whoa, there goes our, my, our communion message today. You know, we don't want that bit that says if we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified with Him. We want the... Best life now, stuff. That's just a lie. It's sad. That's a con. That's not true. But the Spirit Himself bears witness. He says to us in the depths of our being, You're a child of God. What a great moment that is. Does that mean we're perfect? No. Does it mean we're sinless? No. You know what it does mean? We're accepted. I know about you, that's wonderful to know that God will accept me. Does He want me to just stay the same? No. Is He going to develop me? Yes. Am I going to mature? Absolutely. Is there going to be challenges? Yes. But in all that process, I know fundamentally I'm accepted. So He's not doing it to hurt me, He's not doing it to, to prove that He's God and I'm nothing. Because the Bible says he's love. He cares that much. He doesn't want to leave us where we are. problem with a lot of the doctrines that we're hearing in the world today is it's all about you don't have to change, it's okay. Just be who you want to be. You can choose it. Don't worry. And they say, well, you know, God doesn't care about anything other than he just cares for you and loves you. No, he doesn't want to leave you in that spot. He wants to actually bring you to, the, to experience his glory. Ultimately, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that. Bring, to experience his glory. And we've heard last week and this week about holiness and righteousness and being right with God through Christ. That's why we hang out here to remind ourselves. Why we do communion week by week to remind ourselves that it's because of what Jesus did, his brokenness. He says, you know what? I did this 
to start you on the journey that says, and you know where we start? You're welcome and you're accepted, but I'm not going to leave you there. When I first, again, I, I was only a Christian about six months, and I was invited, there were some people praying. We had an upper room in Sturt Street, of course. We're good Pentecostals. We had, we had every Pentecostal had, church had an upper room. There was an upper room here too, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. And so people that are interested in being, receiving the Spirit of God were going to the upper room. I got invited just to, be a, to, to see what this was about because I asked the question, what's this stuff about? I was studying, I was in high school. I was, I'd done about three or four years of Japanese. Okay, I spoke. No, I, I can still hear Japanese. I, I'm very limited in my, I can greet people. But I'm sitting in this thing and this guy's praying for this guy and in clear Japanese, look at it. This is what this guy, he looks at me, he opens his eyes, he looks at me and this guy says in pure Japanese, I'm showing you this. I just about fainted. I couldn't get out of there quick enough. Like hair, every hair on my body was standing up and I was out of there. It's like, what is going on? But I learned that the Spirit of God does that. Phenomenal moment. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, with children of God, you're accepted. But don't, we're not meant to stay there. The promise of the Father, as I've said, you know, was the baptism receiving of the Holy Spirit like Acts 2 pronounced by Jesus in Acts 1.8? Yeah, absolutely. When we talk about water baptism, we describe baptism because it's, it's actually a transliteration, it's not actually an English word, technically, of the Greek word baptizo, because they couldn't really describe it in a single word in English. And if you're baptised in water, this is the picture. You take a pure linen cloth, and, and to make a cloth, or to be what was important in Jesus' times, was the colour purple. And it, was, it showed, it was, a, it was an expensive Demonstration of expense and enriching, etc. And what they would do is they'd take the plain linen and they'd put it into the water, into the colour, and the colour would impregnate, if you like, the fibres, and they would come out. Now, there was no sign of plain linen, but it was purple. It's royal, rich, expensive purple. It had changed. Now, we say that with water baptism. Same word with baptism in the Spirit. It's an immersion into, into the Holy Spirit comes upon us and it transforms us. That the very fibre of our being comes alive and changes. That's why the baptism of the Spirit is such an important teaching. Why the baptism of the Spirit? Because the Father promised him. Who consider themselves young men? Hands up. Oh, come on. <laughs> Look, I'll accept some ego issues here too. So, young men? All right, yeah, thank you. There's some brave young men, yeah. Uh, old men? I'll put myself, yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay, and then there's those, the old men that are deaf, okay, that's an, a selective deafness, but, you know, it's called denial, but we won't go there. Young women? Come on, hands up, young women. And those that are a bit older than young women, anyone? Thank you. Yeah, well, that was, yeah, that's right. The ordinary? Any ordinary people in this place? I'm an ordinary person, yeah. Any males in this place? I know it's politically not correct to say that, but anyway, any males? Females? You know, women? Yeah, oh, goodness me. Hey, we all qualify. But it's not automatic. Is it for me? I believe it is for, for you and for me. Prophecy, sons and daughters prophesying. How wonderful is that? Young people, children, seeing visions, dreaming dreams. Let me remind you also that this is not extra biblical revelation. Let's make that clear. It all must be framed within the context of Scripture. God does not in any way contradict his word in any way we must remember that Pentecostals have been accused some Pentecostal people have actually brought that on themselves because they present it as like the, the new revelation no if I've, 
You know, there's the scripture in Jeremiah, you know, I'm doing a new thing. I think it's Jeremiah. I'm doing a new thing. The number of times I've heard that so badly abused is frightening. You know what the new thing is? It's not falling down. It's not barking like a dog. It's, you know what it is? In context, the new covenant. God says, there's the old covenant, I'm doing a new thing. This new thing is going to transform life. There's going to be a prophetic thing in Joel that says what it's going to look like. This is new, never seen before. And the context of Acts chapter 2 says, you know, from the resurrection to the second coming of Christ, this is what it's going to look like. We should expect those things. We should look for those things. Grounded in the word of God, grounded in prayer, grounded in community, grounded in accountability, but seeking the leading of the Spirit of God in every aspect of our lives. Why aren't we prophesying? I've had people, you know, I'm sure Dawn's heard it, because Dawn moves really well in the, in the area of the prophetic. Okay? I've had people say, oh, why is it only certain people prophesy? You know what my answer to that is? Why aren't you? Come on. If it is for the maidservants and the manservants and the male and the kids and the, you know, and the old men who are asleep in church having dreams, uh, well, no, that's not how it works, is it? But you see what I'm saying? It's meant to bring us to alive, to engage at that level with, the, with Christ, to engage with the Father, because the third person of the Trinity, the, the, very, the very Holy Spirit himself, is engaging at an intimate, personal, and human level, and a spiritual level in us. And he says, I've all this stuff. Why are you holding back? Just do the stuff that the Scripture says. Forget the other stuff. Let the Spirit decide what he's going to do. But when we come into our Bible studies, our fellowships, church, are we coming in, you know, or we leave, this is how we leave. This is how, you know, not our church, this is other churches, you know. People walk away and say, well, the worship sucked a bit today, you know. Or the worship was brilliant today, oh, the presence of God was great. Oh, worship sucked today with no presence of God. What? I had someone say to me, we, you sing songs too many times. And I find it hard to worship. What? When the Spirit of God comes upon a person, you can worship when everyone is singing out of tune. JV, you like Tamil worship music, don't you? Yeah. I'm going to insult Tamil worship music. Forgive me, all right? It's like listening to cats being brought through a, a, a strainer. But JV loves it, don't you, Lou? It's here, yeah, it's fantastic. And it's just like, so maybe one Sunday, JV, we'll do worship, Tamil worship, okay? Yeah. And then, and then afterwards, we'll poll how the service went. So how was the service? You will be scared now if you actually, you know, said what we're going to do. But, but it's just like, oh, context, really? We come prepared, empowered by the Spirit of God to give, to serve, to lay our lives down, to be Christ to people. To love in a way that is beyond human, just like. Because this is what most human love is, is like. It's temporary, it's not deep, it's not sacrificial. To love in a way that, that is empowered by the Spirit of God. Look at the transformation of Paul from a murderer to a martyr. Peter from a betrayer to a, almost a theologian. Lays his life down and he refused to be to be um, executed on a cross as he was going to be. So they executed him upside down, says tradition, because he wouldn't dare to align himself with Christ in his death. The incredible, the empowerment of the Spirit. That's what the baptism in the Spirit is about. There is suffering involved. Why? Because the enemy hates it when, when the ordinary people, the ordinary people actually become empowered to live that life. He hates it. And you know what? You see it around the world in churches who pre preach against the, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Can I say this? This is a little controversial. There's more written about being empowered by the Holy Spirit than there is about tithing in the New Testament. Did you know that? Yet time and time and time again, there's lots of, you know, about money and got to give and all that. But, but they, don't, they, they avoid this big time. Why? Well, nothing weird happens in our church. Really? 
To see people come into Jesus Christ is one of the greatest things you can ever see. To see someone healed of illness and disease is, is incredible. Incredible. To see someone's life is broken and battered and rejected and they find hope and they find acceptance in Christ will bring you to tears. I want that sort of weird in our church. I want to see the Spirit of God move in, in people's lives so that Monday and Tuesday we become dangerous people in as much as we're going to love dangerously. We're going to sacrifice dangerously. We're going to speak truth dangerously, all wrapped in love. Not to hurt, not to break, but we're going to do what Jesus did, who laid down his life for those that even killed him. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Rather than let's rise up against them and we'll beat them. And He could have done that. He could have ran legions of angels, but he chose not to. I want that. So, coming to the end of this little message. Some questions for you. Is the Spirit-filled life for you? Because at the end of the day, my, my pressing, as I am today, and I am pressing, I'm, I make no, no apology, is, is really irrelevant. I can give you information, I can give you facts, I can, and I will send you back to the Scriptures. Please, go back to the Scriptures for yourself. Is the Spirit-filled life for you? Because if you say yes, Satan opposes this, he will oppose you. There's no question about that. He does not want people to hear, believe and receive this gift because it draws them close to God and they become active. He will convince you that it's not for today, it doesn't matter and all you have to do is read your Bible and hide away and don't you dare let the sinners near the, near the church. Okay? This is what, that's what we see a lot in the church. Humble, spirit, notice that? Humble, spirit-filled people are dangerous to his kingdom. He hates it and he hates them. Okay, so I ask the question, is the spirit food life for you? Second one, can you believe it's part of God's plan? It's not an extra, it's not like, it's only for the special view. Or is it for everybody? Can you believe the spirit is actually lovable? Can you love the Holy Spirit? Many people say they love Jesus. I love it when I hear prayers, when they pray, Father, I love that. Because it shows a, just a connection. Can you believe this is scriptural? You might, be, you might be struggling with what I'm saying today. Fine, that's okay. Go back to the scriptures. Come talk to me. Go back to the scriptures. Look at the passages that talk about the Spirit of God. If you do believe it's scriptural, then do what the scripture says. Ask. Ask. Lord, like it was in Acts chapter 2, like it was in Acts 19, like it was throughout all of history that we know. I can point you to documents that were written from, from the uh, second century on, talking about the gifts of the Spirit, miracles, healings, baptism of the Spirit, tongues, prophecies, right through history. The trouble is we read material that only agrees with us. It's time to read some things that don't agree. You don't go and do the proper research yourself and find out. But if yes, great, ask. If not, go back to the Scriptures and find out. Do you want to be filled? Why? Oh, I want to speak in tongues. Ah, no, hang on. There's more to it than that. Oh, I want to be powerful. Ah, right, wrong. Because <laughs> when you... you actually move into the area of the, the Holy Spirit. Humility is the test, not arrogance and prominence. Christ becomes all in all. That becomes really important. Are you sure you need him? Well, I read my Bible every day. I give to the church. I pray. I'm a nice person, you know. I don't need anything else. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're satisfied with that. Well, maybe you're not. Maybe you're a person that says, you know what, I do all that stuff, but there seems to be something more required. Luke 24, 44 through 49 is for you. How to receive four simple words. Renounce, relax, receive and respond. Renounce, 
2 Corinthians 4 2 says, But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Acts 5 32 says, And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. If you're not obeying God, don't ask. Because you won't get. The principles of God are, are fairly clear. If you're disobedient, you, you need to repent. Turn away from those things, confess those things, turn to God. If you're involved in, in secret things, break them, get out of them. And until you do that, don't ask. Because you know what to do. So re renunciation is simple. A simple prayers like this is one I remember praying long, many years ago. I renounce witchcraft, idolatry, ancestor worship, Ouija boards, sorcery, tarot cards, tea leaves, fortune-telling charms, amulets, secret societies, other gods, and anything else that I have put above you, God. I renounce it all. I break the ties with those things. And I, I want nothing to do with them. And Holy Spirit, help me to hate those things because they re represent sinful things. Second one is relax. It's important. People tense up. They think, this is going to be weird. What if I speak in tongues? Oh, for goodness sake, relax. Do you trust the Spirit of God or not? Do you trust the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? Yes or no? Relax. It's a promise, the Father. Disciples were sitting on the day of Pentecost. You're in good hands, the hands of Jesus. Jesus is the baptizer. Third one is receive. Ask Jesus to baptize you. Ask to receive that gift. Therefore, if you, although you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father from heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This, this, this is... This teaching has been, is revolutionary because in generations gone by, the church had no, never heard this stuff before. Um, and it had been sort of almost eliminated from the dialogue and doctrines of the church. They were evil. When I came to Christ, the CRC in Australia, Pastor Leo Harris on the Saturday's paper on page three, top right corner, he advertising the, the services. And one was the Warner Theatre, which is where I was a, a, a public theatre that they rented on a Sunday night, which is where I went and found Christ. And you know what people said? It's a cult. And they believed in, in this. So receive. Ask simply, quietly, and faith, trusting Jesus, believing. Don't, you don't beg, plead, moan, groan, but receive. It's by faith. There's a faith moment here for you. When you've asked quietly, ask him to fill you in the spirit with the spirit, then in faith you must believe that he's answered your prayer and receive the spirit by faith. Mark eleven twenty four. For this reason I tell you, whatever you pray for, pray when it, sorry, whatever you pray and ask for, believe that you have received it and it'll be yours. Do we believe this or not? Coming to the end. Remember the important thing is not what you feel, but what you believe. We live in a world where feeling is everything. Where Jesus said, he who believes in me, out of him will flow rivers of living water. Wow. And that believing is trusting in him. The last is respond. Speak what comes to you. I would probably be classified more charismatic than Pentecostal in traditional sense, whereas I actually believe that prophecy in the scriptures is also part of it as well. I know of people that prophesy way before they've ever spoken in tongues. And you see the Spirit of God moving in their life. Go back to Acts and have a look for yourself. Let the Spirit give you the evidence of His presence. It's really important. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Remember, this is all given by grace. Promised by the Father, given by Jesus the miracle is not speaking in tongues or the ability to give a prophecy, but occurs when the Holy Spirit gives you the words to speak in a language you'd not learned or a message that was not yours, was his. That's the miracle. That requires faith. That requires us to step into that. If you've ever prophesied, often what the Spirit does, he gives us a glimpse, a little bit. 
and the rest comes as we launch and, and demonstrate. We walk by faith, not by sight, and we step in by faith. So my conclusion, the Holy Spirit being a person, he loves and cares as much as Jesus does for you, as much as the Father does for you, because they are of the same essence. They're the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And it says, God is love. They are all love. And he comes. You know, the, the thing that I find disturbing about the Spirit, sometimes he comes with some sense of force, but it's still, he won't, he won't intrude into a person who says, no, I don't want this. But he comes willingly when, he say, when they say, come, Holy Spirit. So, I'm not advocating wacko stuff. I'm not advocating any of that. But I am advocating this, that each of us would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Overflowing in our lives. Overflowing like that rivers of living water. Touching dead places and dry places. Touching people who struggle with with pain and suffering and with all the, you know what the answer to all this identity crisis is? An experience of the loving God who says, I accept you and bring you here, but I'm not going to leave you here. Come with me. Let's start this journey. You know, you'd be born again, born from above. Let's start this journey. And he gives us something that is incredibly, fits in beautifully with what we shared last week in this week. And that he grants us to become righteous in Christ and holy and that process of holiness then becomes that life journey as he changes us and challenges us and he moves us into that place and then one day we'll stand before him we'll give an account but the Holy Spirit is here right now ask 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 may not have been your teaching from where you've come from in, in, you know, may not ask. Do I what the scripture says? Come on, let's stand to our feet. I want to pray then at the end of the service. If anyone wants prayer, specific, this area, come. Let's pray together. I might need some help if you get a few people. So you need to come. Don't be afraid. Father, thank you. Thank you, your plan right back that the prophets even spoke. But Lord, that we would see in this picture of the church filled with people, Lord, ordinary people, maid servants, you know, servants, employees, not famous people, mums and dads and kids and just people. Lord, with visions and dreams and serving and loving you, laying down their lives because they're empowered to do that. And so, Father, we thank you that that was always your intention. I pray, Father, for the, I pray for the greater church in New Zealand, for an outpouring of your spirit that is, that is not just an emotional response to what we want, but, Lord, of what you want, an outpouring of what you want in your people. I pray for the church, Lord. Lord, that maybe the, the church like that guy in Wairoa, nothing strange ever happens or nothing weird ever happens there. Lord, I pray that, that uh, his eyes would be open to understand there's more to church and life than just comfort or safety. But Father, we ask for you now pouring your spirit across this nation. Lord, on our church as well, on our children, Lord, particularly we pray for their children, Lord. They live in this world of many ideologies and doctrines being forced and spoken and they're hearing. Father, through the power of your spirit, empower them to live the life of Christ where they are, in Jesus' name, in peace, in humility, Lord, and, in, and, in, and just in that place where they know you. We pray for that. And I pray, Father, for maybe the people here struggling with what I've said. Lord, through the power of your Spirit and the work of your Holy Spirit, the person of the Spirit, guide them through the Scriptures. Open their hearts, Lord, to, to walk the walk, to be close to you, to ask that question, what is it, could I be filled with the Spirit of God? And so, Lord, in the name of Jesus, 
I thank you. Thank you for the heritage of this church. Thank you for the leaders of this church. I thank you for those that are spirit-filled in this church. Lord, but we pray, Father, for a greater empowerment for all of us. In Jesus' glorious name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Wonderful. God bless you. If you need some prayer, just come. Hang on before you go. Just a little announcement. Um, just had a little visit from the um, principal of the school up in um, Mount Cook where we park, where the overflow parks. Just a couple of things in that um, we're not to park in her park which has got Principal's Park on it. That's first point. I didn't know that, but, you know, we've got the arrangement. And then secondly, any of the red priority parks, we can't park in either because they're rented. But she uh, just was out there just while we we're having our service and, and just um, said these things to us. But uh, we're, I guess while we have the arrangement in place, it's quite helpful because we don't know when and if. Um, they're going to start on two apartment blocks next door. Um, but uh, just remember, and um, for the owner of um, GSF 949, Toyota Vanguard, is that right? She's just parked across your park uh, in front of your car, but she'll only be there for about until one o'clock. Sorry about that. <laughs> Who's, who owns GSF? Ah. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no, I, I didn't know either. But as long as you have the arrangement, don't forget to put one of these on your um, dash because she's looking for that. If you do that and don't park in her park in the red park, she'll be fine.